tremendous talk We got the industry, tea and the jokes Actors, directors, musicians and more You're listening to Tremendous Talk Hey everyone, I'm Wa. And I'm Ash, and this is the Tremendous Talk Podcast. Each week, join us as we guide you through the realms of Hollywood and beyond while we speak to industry professionals in the spotlight. So, grab a boba tea and leave your shoes at the door. Welcome to Tremendous Talk! Yeah! Yes, everyone. Welcome to Tremendous Talk. My name is La. I'm a Filipino Indian actor, host, and filmmaker who is so sleepy this morning. But that's okay. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get there. We got the caffeine flowing. Uh, and here's my co-host. Hi, my name is Ashley, and I'm a mixed Filipino-American actor, musician, and publicist who, uh, I got a grasshopper to the face the other day while I was riding my roller skates, so that's an oh, update. <laughs> disgusting. Did it say, did it apologize? No, I feel like grasshoppers are good luck, and it just, I think it just got in the, it, like, we were crossing paths in this universe, and mm. we just kind of uh, boinked together, and it went huh. its way, and I went my way. That sounds way more beautiful and poignant than me gearing up to say, oh, more like ass hopper, am I right? <laughs> so that's a kind of our perspectives for the day, I think. <laughs> oh, that's that's lovely. That's lovely. Gotta love co-hosts, right? Yeah. There's a balance in the world. There's a balance. balance. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me what is balancing you, what you're watching, what you're doing, what you're loving. You know what? I, uh, I, what I'm watching, the only thing you can really think of right now is the new Flash movie. I watched it yesterday. Um, people have been calling it the best comic book movie of all time. And I'm here to say I disagree with that. I don't think, I don't really know what fits that title, but I, I'm like, I'm wondering if something was lost on me because like I didn't hate it. But I didn't love it the way that everyone seems to love it. Like even Tom Cruise talked about this. You know what I mean? Tom Cruise saw The Flash and he's like, hey, I think what you're doing for movies, you know, like, sorry, I don't have a Tom Cruise impression. <laughs> but like, yeah, it was just OK to me. And uh, so so that's what I've been watching. That's kind of like all I've been thinking about because I'm trying to write a review for it or I'll make a little review video. And I'm just like, why did everyone love it more than me? <laughs> yeah. I also like have a bias because Ezra Miller has done some really bad things recently. Um, yeah. but they were, they were decent in the film. Uh, I have nothing against like the writing or like the film itself. It's just, I don't think it's the best of the best, you know? That's a big, a big swing. Yeah. Best superhero movie of all time. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like everyone's saying that. I'm just like, all right, don't overhype this for me, please. Uh, what about <laughs> you? What are you watching? That? Oh, sorry. I'm watching. No, I just wanted to know, did you hear, like, it's the best movie before you saw it or after you saw it? Before. So I saw oh. all of this positive stuff. So I'm here, people of the internet, to make sure that you temper your expectations. Because uh, I went in thinking it was going to be perfection and it wasn't. Ah. Yeah. Well, on my side, I'm watching Hi, uh, Why Women Kill. <laughs> Why women kill? Why does that sound so familiar? What is that about again? It's on. It's just about. It's like these. This house that has these three couples in it from three different kind of times in the world, and their relationships with their spouses and kind of how they handle things. And there's like a murder plotline. Actually, Lily is in the in the series. I haven't gotten oh. to see her yet in the series, but she plays in the series. I think in with Lucy Liu. I think she's in the scenes with Lucy Liu. That's in that right. timeline. But I could be yeah. wrong. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm very excited. Wow. So you're watching a series with the guest in it and you haven't gotten there yet. What an exciting coincidence that the timing made made sense. That's awesome. The world is a lovely place. <laughs> Balance, as we say. Um, as far as like other obsessions for me right now, I made the parasite noodles. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about when I say that. Yeah, It's like yeah, half yeah. champong, half uh, chapgetti, and then like beef. And it was awesome. <laughs> and so, but I made too much. So I've just like been slowly eating some of that. You know what I mean? Um, oh man, there's nothing so good that you have. Like you, you made food with your eyes and you have this giant family serving for like 24 people. And it's just you in the house. And you're like, yeah. well, this is both great and bad. I've made a mistake, but have I? 
It's like me with Phil Spaghetti's uh, spaghetti. It's like me with uh, <laughs> Japanese curry. You know what I mean? Like, I just overdo it. Dude, Zen curry has been one of my favorite eats so far right now. Wait, yeah. wait, are you picking up the guitar? Like, tell me about that. No, I'm just coming back to it. I mean, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I don't know. Like, every time I've, like, picked up the guitar recently, I feel like, oh, man, I'm not good at this anymore like not that i was ever like amazing i'm not super ambidextrous or anything like that or like dexterous especially my left hand which is where i hold the frets you know but like um but like i do like singing and strumming you know and then uh i just uh i'm trying to do that more again uh just for like my own mental health i think it's just nice to like have time away to just like sing a little bit and like yeah just like it's my it's like my mom would set up karaoke every Sunday and sing to herself in the living room. This is like my version of that, I think. That makes me so happy. <laughs> self-care. That's our self-care. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> but yeah, that's kind of what I'm doing right now. What about what, what else are you up to? What another obsession? Oh, there's not much recently. I think I've just been kind of like embracing boringness. But outside of that, like I'm doing the things, there's things going on. But I've been loving recently at night, I go into my Libby app for my my uh, library app. And I just mm. read I've been reading so much. Hell and yeah. Right now I'm reading a deadly inside scoop by Abby Colette. I've just the fun stuff, fun little mystery little things that fiction mystery. Yeah, dude, there, there was like a five-year period i didn't read any fiction and i was just like in a self-help book <laughs> oh yeah yeah <sighs> yeah i i personally prefer fiction obviously if you can't tell by looking at my background but like like <laughs> yeah i think it's it's just nice it's like true escapism you know what i yeah. mean it's like yeah, it's dude. like watching a movie but you make make the imagery in your head i don't know reading is beautiful but i don't do it enough <laughs> I promise I will. Podcasts will hold me accountable. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of making imagery in your head, what have you been up to in your life? That was a weird transition. <laughs> I'll take it. I mean, uh, I've been doing. I did a workshop with the Barcada, my Barcada class last night. It was in person. We had Drea Walter, and yeah, and Bia was there. You know, and then another. Uh, there was another director named Paige Compton, and it was all their scripts. So we kind of just like workshopped them. There's like the for the scene that I did with Denise Cavanella, actually, uh, it was the first time the director had seen it acted out. So that was really cool. Uh, just to see everyone in person and get to play. That was amazing. Uh, and on top of that, another Barcada movement is on Saturday, I'm filming a little uh, scene with another Barcada family guy named uh, Ray, Ray Ramundo. And so uh, we wrote a little uh, scene about two Filipino brothers. And so that's like, I'm just excited to like practice in a time that it's very slow in terms of like finances and income and, and writing. Right. So like, so I'm just excited to keep that creative bug fulfilled, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes me so happy. Oh, I love it. I love it. Anytime <laughs> I mention the or anything, it just makes me happy. I'm so excited to see your scene, dude. I can't wait to watch that. Oh, I hope it's good. But we we wrote the script and uh, and it's good. And he and I look alike, so it's 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 cool. Oh, perfect. But, <laughs> but let's let what's the new thing in your life? Because I just looked at the bullet point and it sounds way more exciting than what I'm talking about. So fill me in. <laughs> Yesterday I was on set and we shot a promo for the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl is going to be in Vegas next year. Mm. I know freaking nothing about sports, dude, like nothing. Mm. And so when talent's being brought out, like we're just sitting there, it was through my modeling agency. So we're kind of just like filling it. We're not like a talent or anything, but it's just fun to be there on set for the day. Right. Yeah. And so talent comes on and I'm like, well, I've seen these people. Before. Where, where are these guys from? So I, I like, I'm looking up names. I'm Googling whatever I can find. And they're from, the NFL, oh, I don't remember the name of the show, but they're like NFL talk hosts, right? And okay, some yeah. of them were coaches on my my friends' teams and stuff. So it was exciting to be able to share that with friends. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but, oh, I don't know. Maybe I won't say it. I well, got to see if, some... if you don't. If you don't know, maybe we don't say. <laughs> maybe I won't say it then, but I got to see some, like, Super Bowl stuff. Ooh. I wish I thought it was cooler, but I mean, like, it was cool to see. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah. And we got to watch some of the um, Mad Apple show at the New York, New York here in Vegas. Oh. Which, it was a fun day. It was a fun day. Lots of That's a super a cool things. day. Yeah, it was it was a good time on set. Just happy to be on set, honestly, and doing yeah, stuff, whatever we can do. Um, Sometimes and, it's just nice to just like yeah. be in the atmosphere of it, you know? Yeah, just to see a nice little Ronin rig or something. Like, it just makes me happy every <laughs> once in a while. For sure. Um, the whole time on set, though, this Ronin rig was a doozy. I was like, wow, it's like a it's like a monster. It's yeah. Giant and mechanic. It was great. Like, it was oh so cool. I love I love a good rig um but yeah i think in general too i'm just <laughs> don't take that out of context don't clip that dude <laughs> that's so funny that sh- we should make that into a sound bite i love a good rig and it would come up it would come up a lot on this podcast because we're gonna have like cinematographers and shit <laughs> it's just like that's so funny instead of like a we have like, i love a good rig yeah. yeah. Oh, and now man. and now there's there's several takes of you saying it so we can throw it in whatever oh, yeah, whatever options. kind of style we want. Yeah, exactly. Oh. But that's a that's an exciting day. It's a it, I mean as as far as like sports, I totally get what you mean. I remember one time I shot a wedding and it was like on this like really nice golf course and I was like I think it was like a PGA golf. I don't know. I don't know. And there were all these trophies and they were like, oh, my God, isn't this amazing? And I was like, yeah, they're really cool trophies. And they're like, oh, do you like golf? And I was like, no, not really. I know Tiger Woods. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, these are these are like really important. It's like, no, they're not. Not to me. You know what I mean? So I, I totally get what you mean. Uh, if it was Quidditch, that'd be a different story. Then I'd be hella jazzed. That's so funny. (laughs) Like all the things that would just like light our fire super much. And then the things that were like, ah, that's, that's all right. That's cool. Yeah. Like if someone, dude, if someone was on set with a drum set, I would be like drooling over it. Right. But I saw Super Bowl stuff and I'm like, that's nice for someone else. But I'm For somebody else. (laughs) Yeah. You're, (laughs) you're drooling over the rig and the C-stands and the, and crafty, you know, those would be Um, important things for us. The lights. Gotta love lights. Uh, in a second, we're going to talk to a very special guest, and we're very excited to introduce you to her. Lily is a force. You may have seen her on Broadway and South Pacific in series such as Woo Assassins, The Exorcist, and Quantico. You may have most recently seen her in Damien Chazelle's Babylon. She's got it all, dude. The best red carpet style, a badass dog named Toto, and talent that doesn't quit. And she's an animal advocate, which I can't wait to talk about. Oh my gosh. Welcome to the Tremendous Podcast, Lily. Yay! Yay! <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> Good. Oh, that makes me happy. Okay, so something I actually didn't hear about during all the press that we did for Babylon is your animal advocacy. And I'm a little vegan lady, so that made me over the moon happy. Can you talk a little bit about that? I first had gotten my dog, a little Maltese named Suki, over 20 years ago, I think. It just changed my life, as all dogs do. I, I, I don't trust anyone who's never whose heart's never been touched by a dog. Um, But because of my love for my dogs, uh, I have kind of just dived into this whole animal welfare and I have been doing everything that I can, just try my best in, you know, advocating and raising awareness and letting people make their own decisions uh, for their themselves. Mm -hmm. I love that. And your dog has gone through freaking heart surgery. Like, what a soldier. I took him overseas to get open heart surgery. Little dogs are very prone to heart disease. Oftentimes, most small dogs are diagnosed with heart murmurs, which later turn into congestive heart failure. So when I learned that there was one surgeon in the world uh, who uh, performs hearts or open heart surgeries on hearts this big, uh, I jumped at the idea of it and I got him a very successful but risky surgery. Aww, yeah. buddy. We love you, Toto. Yeah, he's the best. Are you a fan of Wizard of Oz? Is that where that came from? I am, but that's not how it was. So <laughs> I had a Maltese named Suki, and when we got Toto, we named him Toki. The problem was every time I called Toki, Suki would respond. Mm. And so it got a little bit crazy. And then we thought, why don't we just call him Toto? And then it just worked out. And he's just such a Toto. Aww, I still wait. speak of him as if he's around because I'm sure his energy is still around. So. 100%. Oh, 100%. 100%. 
He's probably 100. in the room with you right now during this. For podcast. sure. So <laughs> you guys talking about me? What the hell? <laughs> I get my name. <laughs> okay, so with all of this too, I know during our interviews and everything, like four minutes back to back, you're like repeating these questions to people. You're repeating these <laughs> answers and these press junkets. It's a crazy time. But I do. You, do you think you were able to really get people like into who you are and, and your personality and everything? Everybody was so interested in um, how the orgy party was filmed. Everybody was curious about, I mean, I would be too, how, what Brad Pitt was like. He was lovely. And how, you know, kissing Margot was, it was amazing. So, you know, like what, nobody cared about, you know, what I wanted to eat on set or, you know, what my secondary activity was. <laughs> okay, wait, hold the phone right there. We're going to do a lightning round of questions. Yeah, we're going to ice break this. <laughs> get ready. Because you're going to, okay. we're going to get a little deep dive into Lily right now. <laughs> okay, so uh, it's just going to be, you know, standard lightning round. I'll ask a question. Just answer whatever's on top of your head. All right. Okay. All right. Let's do this. Favorite food. Uh, dumplings. Ooh, what kind? What's inside? Um, usually seafood. Um, vegetarian, totally okay with that too. But I'm not a fan of red meat because I uh, mm. can't handle it. <laughs> <laughs> and what's your favorite day off? Um, Fridays because I have Aww. two days to look forward to. Oh, that's so nice. What, what do you do mm -hmm. on your day off? What's your ideal? Like, how do you spend it? It used to be really social, but now I'm completely content. Just, you know, starfishing on my couch. <laughs> oh, I love it. Do you ever just sit and watch Dodo videos or something and just like... Dodo is my all-time favorite. It is my dream to to meet the creators of that that Instagram account. Oh my gosh. We're manifesting. Wait, Lily, can I make so, this happen oh, for you? Am I going to yes! make a dream for you? You got a publicist on your side. Yeah, let's do this. Okay. <laughs> oh Lily and Dodo. Oh my gosh. Down. This would also be good out. for me. I, I would just be crying the entire time, even just looking at the page of just tears. Okay, yeah, well, this is about you. Always. An unpopular yeah. opinion that Lily has. Unpopular opinion? Oh, I don't like pizza or bread. Okay, you know what's so funny? Every <laughs> single time we ask this question, pizza gets brought up. Really? Yeah. Oh my God, people think I'm the strangest person for not liking pizza. I mean, I don't dislike it, but it's not a food I would ever go. If I were alone, I'd never order pizza. Mm. I'll eat it if the entire group wants to. Um, yeah, and bread because it's like uh -huh. cardboard. That's so thing. funny because you lived in New York. <laughs> for, you know, for you live in New York for so long. That's Wait, so no, funny. what's your classic like New Yorker style food that you go for? Because it's a it's a lot of carby stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we're lucky. Like right now, I'm at my mom's and she lives in Flushing, so downstairs I can have any type of Asian cuisine, which oh, I will, dude. you know, never get sick of. Um, you got the balut but, guy I mean, on the corner. That's the true. The balut guy but, uh, on the corner. Yeah, but, but, but um, dumplings, it is, you know, carbs, but dumplings I can do. <laughs> Fantastic. I love that. And then during, like, happy hour, what do you get? Your drink of choice and, like, a little snacky snack. Usually um, uh, uh, vodka soda. Uh, anything sweet gives me a raging headache. Um, and espresso martinis if I am a little bit tired. Oh, okay. Look at you. And then, okay. I know you are like so talented with all the things you do and we're going to geek out about this later, but do you have a hidden talent that no one knows about you? Oh my gosh. I uh, maybe I have some things. I can't, nothing off the top of my head. Uh, maybe we can come back to it. <laughs> It'll come up during the podcast or at 3 a.m. tonight. You're going to text me and Jeremy. Yeah. I'm like, this is what I'm good at. <laughs> I found out I'm really good at juggling. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's the lightning round for now, but I'm sure we'll ask a bunch of these questions later. Law, take it over. I've been talking way too much. No, you're good. Um, I mean, you know, it's it's interesting to, to, to hear you talk about kind of the aftermath of the press cycle of the aftermath of like the awards season, but I, I, we're here for some of the tea, you know what I mean? And I'm wondering like of the awards shows, which one would you like, what is it actually like sitting through an award show and which one was your actual favorite of the awards season when you got, you know, SAG awards or like, or the golden globes. I really enjoy the SAG Awards because it's obviously, you know, our own peers and everybody's just there to support each other. And it was really, the the energy was amazing. And also, of course, I got to, 
you know, present with my co-stars at the SAG Awards, which I felt was really special. And, um, but what I found, because this is my first uh, award season of this size uh, <laughs> and of this caliber, um, it was so strange to me that by the time we finished the press line at the Golden Globes and we sat down, there was a dessert in front of me and I didn't understand why the salad looked like a cake. And I kept looking at the menu and I just thought, why is this salad so cakey looking? And I learned that they were serving dinner while we were on the press line. And it made no sense because nobody was there. So all I could think about was the amount of food that went to waste, mm. how hungry I was. And this is why everybody is wasted during the awards. And this is why everybody went up and they were <laughs> just plastered because what else are you going to eat? I sat down, there was a tiny cheesecake of some sort and that was it. And you know, whatever leftover bread they had, which I don't like. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah. So it's like a perfect storm of dissatisfaction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. After you finish the press circuit and you were at home, you know, it's finally your time. What were you doing? How did you fill your time? Um, how did you kind of nurse yourself back to health, I guess? Uh, In a dark room, no windows open, very cold. <laughs> um. So... I'm usually very, very healthy. I have a routine. I juice. I exercise multiple times a week. I did none of that. I just never ate on schedule, starved for hours while traveling or doing interviews, and then would just stuff my face and then be in a food coma and then later go out and socialize and, you know, have alcohol. Just terrible mix of, um, of choices all around. And so when I got back, um, I avoided COVID for all of three years and I got it. The, and I thought, well, if there's one place, the day, the night I landed ah. back in New York from, from all the Oscars parties, very mild for me to get it. It's, it's one of those 18 parties that we all went to in that one week. Uh, and it was very, I was very fortunate. It was very, and soon after that, I booked a last minute trip to Thailand and just did more damage to my uh, gut by just eating days. And they obviously have every cuisine, you know, everything that I saw, the hotels we stayed at, I think it's very popular there. Every single hotel has breakfast, but they have to cater to Western American continental breakfasts as long as well as uh, Asian dim sum breakfast. So I had a little bit of everything and I was constantly, constantly full. And when I came back home, I just thought, all right, now I need to, I need to get it together. So I've been juicing every day, lemon water every morning, celery juice, um, probiotics, vitamins, uh, just getting my ba body back in shape and then going back to my workout classes. And I feel much better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that. Wait, what's Good. your workout drug of choice? What's your favorite class to go to? I still do. I've been doing SoulCycle for a really long time. And I also have a SoulCycle at home bike, which was a savior during the lockdown. But now it, um, and I'm vaccinated. I can, I have no self-discipline. I'm on the bike and I'm on my phone. So now I'm finally, now, now that I've had come go into the soul cycle studio, uh, with more ease. And I've, uh, recently done that this past week, I did a bunch of classes. It was great. And I also really love, um, uh, what do you call it? The Legree method, the, uh, mega former Pilates, which which is um, in in New York, there's one, it's called SLT, Slim Lean Tone, something like that. Mm. And then in LA, it's extremely popular. It's basically Pilates on I was going to say, it sounds it's like the final a, boss a of device. Pilates. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's one of those things, you know, five minutes in, you're doing a plank on a, um, a, a, uh, um, what do you call it? A, a moving platform. So you're trying to hold yeah. it and you're already quivering 
within the first five minutes. It's a mo- it's amazing and it transforms your body very, very quickly. I feel like dancers in specific have this like calling to that form of Pilates and I just see them on these mechanical machines that look like they're from the Renaissance <laughs> and it's just terrifying. Yeah. Like, oh man. Do you think your your dance background kind of pushed you into liking things like that? Totally. And I um you know, even though I, I no longer really dance, I think that everyone should s- should grow up. You know, if I ever have children, I think that I would put them in dance classes, not because I want them to be dancers. Please don't be dancers. I just, the instability is terrible. It teaches you so much body awareness and discipline and uh, posture. And, you know, you become so much more aware of your body. And I think that is something that even though in the beginning stood in my way of acting, because I didn't know how to carry myself like a normal person. I just went on stage and I was like, all right, I'm ready. (laughs) Just being all uh, poised and stuff. But I really think that everyone can benefit from uh, movement classes of some sort. Ah, I think that's so important too. Like even now I danced what, like 10 years ago or something in college. Mm-hmm. And even now those stretches that we do are oh, like so burned good. into my brain. I can never, yeah. and then the way you move, it kind of affects the way you move for the rest of your life. You're kind totally. of connected in that way. That's yeah. so neat. Um, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I want to, I just like, I'm looking at this scene in my head when you're singing My Girl's Pussy and I can see your <laughs> dance background and your influence just like spilling out in that scene. You know and that the swag um, is drippy too. Yeah, I mean, I I said this in all of the other interviews. I really hope one day we'll get to see the full number because we spent so long rehearsing it. And Mandy Moore, who choreographed La La Land, did this amazing dance for it. Um, so I don't know. It's a shame. I have a little clip from one of uh, our assistants. Uh, She took a little video from the balcony during one of the um, rehearsals. So maybe I'll post that. Oh my gosh. That would be awesome though if (laughs) Paramount released a like director's cut of Babylon and it's just like three hours long with Lily's backstory in it. That would be so... It'd be closer to four hours long at that point. Well, the original (laughs) cut was four and a half hours. Yeah, yeah. I want to see four hour cut Lady Fate 2, backstory, everything. <laughs> that was the whole nine yards, dude. Okay. So speaking of that, I just randomly, your dad was an artist, right? Yes. He's... What the heck is it like growing up in a house where your dad isn't like, we're so used to Supportive these stories. Supportive artists. Of, yeah, our parents are Filipino <laughs> and they're nurses and they're like, never go into the arts. My... But your dad's an artist. Yeah, I think that's why my parents, my dad, well, this is interesting. I never talked about this before because nobody asked, but when we first moved to New York, uh, we lived in one of those houses in Queens, in Elmhurst, Queens, and we rented a a singular room uh, where my parents and I lived on mattresses with no bed frames, and my Mm -hmm. dad would go to Central Park or Times Square and draw portraits of people for $10 to $15 each. And he was so good and so fast that he always would come home and talk about how competitive he was with his fellow artists. And they would all try to steal customers from each other <laughs> and bet they, they would uh, bet each other that they would finish a portrait within 10 minutes or it would be free for the customers. Yeah. Hold on. That's, That's like awesome. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's an awesome story. <laughs> Can you please write a film about your dad and this like ring of artists that are like getting into fist fights over how long they can do paintings? In? Yeah, it, yeah it, it, it's it's such a talent. It's pretty amazing. But it, it's, it's so funny because I would always want my dad to draw a portrait of me. And to this day, I still don't have one. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's so That's Asian. So <laughs> yes, that, I was gonna say that's a uh, so, so the the love the neglect of love is still there yeah. even with a supportive <laughs> artistic parent. Perfect, awesome. We all oh, have to we go love away. the irony. We all resonate <laughs> with that. Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. did, did that make yeah. you competitive in nature for yourself, like in your own life, like seeing your father kind of do his hustle and and provide? Did you then take that into the arts, into dance, into acting? that same kind of mindset? <laughs> I, I did. I don't agree with it 
you know, as, as I've gotten obviously older, you know, being competitive is definitely not healthy and very unrealistic, but that's mm -hmm. how kind of, that's how I was brought up. You know, you have to be the top of your class. You have to get the best grade. You have to be the best in this. And it was exhausting and it's just not realistic for anyone's health. It's also a survival thing, though, too, right? Like, like yeah. we're, we're all very, very aware that uh, Asians are also treated as, like, second-class citizens sometimes, right? And so you have to be, like, the strongest, fiercest, and most talented person in the room, and you have to assert that, right? I think that comes through in the way you play uh, Lady Feishu in, the, in Babylon, you know? Like, even the way that that character had to carry herself to stand out, um, it mattered, right? Uh, I do, I do want to talk about kind of the styling of that movie, just like to bring us back. Cause you look incredible throughout that whole film, whether it's like the chum song or the, or the top hat with the curly sideburn. Um, what was it like <laughs> seeing yourself for the first time in these like extravagant roaring twenties style, uh, clothing? It was really emotional for were made. And so you really don't see all of which where she was um, a lot more fleshed out. There was, you know, obviously lots of cuts Damien did put into the character me because I felt like, I, I know that we don't get as much backstory on Lady Faye in the final cut of the film, but the script was written uh, in a way where we get to tell this story of this side of her. And so when I was filming it, I just thought, gosh, finally, God, finally of the business and I get to not look like someone fresh off the boat for once <laughs> because that's all, you know, you, as an actress, I've played these roles as well, you know, and my mother would always say, can you just, can we just see you in a production where you are not dressed like in a demeaning way or, or, in a way that doesn't reflect Asians in a positive light. And I agree with her because for a long time in the beginning of my career, we were not playing roles or characters uh, that reflected any power of any empowerment. Um, and so it was very special to me when we were doing honor that Lady Faye it has probably the best costumes in the movie, all the fittings and I personally agree with our costume design because she's just the character herself is such uh, an icon. So yeah. it really was just, I was so, I, I was so fortunate to be able to be a part of that. Well, we need the lady Faye cut because it sounds like we're missing <laughs> a dance number, a little bit of backstory, and then you learning how to drive stick shift. I, I, I need oh, to see <laughs> all of those oh things. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, those stories were really interesting to hear. The whole stick shift thing, that was very funny. So we were filming in Simi Valley, which was an hour away from where we were staying. I was in, I was staying in West Hollywood at the time. And they asked me, they said, hey, Lily, you're going to have to drive stick shift um can we have you learn today in the desert and i said sure so they taught me how to drive stick shift in a hundred year old car uh and they didn't teach me how to drive in second gear because they didn't think that we would need to drive in second gear and so i really you know killed it i was like all right i got this okay cool all right i'll see you guys tomorrow and uh, this is the scene after Margot and I are in the snake fight. So she's all just, you know, still coming back to reality. And she's not supposed to, you know, she's basically a zombie at this point. And she's in the car with me and I'm driving. And the walkie talkie in the back is just Damien screaming faster, faster. And I didn't know how to go faster. Now, this car is 100 years old. So the smoke is coming out and I cannot get this car to go faster. And Marco was like, do you, do you, do you want me to, do you want to change the, the, the stick shift? And I said, no, don't touch me. Don't talk to me. I was so nervous. I was sweating. It was so hot. The car was sweating. We were sweating. We both thought we were going to die. And, <laughs> and then the next take, uh, Damien said that was a perfect take. If only you could just go faster. So I said to Margo, I said, okay, you can, 
walk me through it. And so she was the best ventriloquist because she sat next to me and she talked me through how to drive and change gears. And then she ended up changing the for me while she walked me through the gas brake and clutch. And then after that, we got it. But we were, uh, we definitely thought we were going to overheat and die. And die. <laughs> <laughs> that's insane. That's, that's a real, what a story though. Like you survived that. <laughs> and now you'll always have that in your memory forever. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever been put on the spot like that like hey can you learn stick shift in like 24 hours and then we tape it on camera like for woo assassins or any of the others so, like in quantico did they ever like give you some random thing mm. well, um i i did this show in italy uh that took place in the side because i had forgotten that we took place in the uk uk so they said all right lily you're gonna drive off you're gonna back out of the parking lot and drive off and I got into the car on the wrong day. And they said, you need to back out. I said, you don't understand. I can't just get into this car and back out on the right, right side. I've never driven a car on the right side before. And, I, and then we just did a couple of takes. But they said, you have to speed it up because you look like you're driving That's like an so old funny. lady. It's so weird. Some people can do it. I, some people can just go to the UK and drive. And I could never do that. Here's a follow-up question, actually. Have you ever said to like a casting or a director and just been like, I can do this skill or task, and it was a blatant lie that you had to like fill in later? You know what I mean? Like like Joey Tribbiani drinking a gallon of milk on Friends. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's on his <laughs> resume, but he can't really do it. I've always been very honest about things. I'm a very I'm I'm a very honest person. I have just, you know. Um, I think I can, you know, if people ask me if I speak fluent Chinese, I always tell them I do. And I sound great saying it. You know, there's some people who say they speak Mandarin and then they speak Mandarin on screen. I'm like, ooh, no, nope, that's not Mandarin. Um, I can do it. But because I left Shanghai when I was so young, my vocabulary is very limited. So if people do want me to, act in Mandarin or I always say, give me some time and I'll learn it. But I, I will never say that I can, cause I don't want to be caught in that kind of situation. <laughs> I love that. We love honesty. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a question though. So I, I think everywhere that I have been has affected me so much, whether it been like a vacation or places that I have lived. I don't know if you've talked about this yet, but has your experience living in Shanghai and then living in Bogota and then living in New York and being in LA so much, how has it affected you as a person in like your journey of like Lily now? Uh, of course, definitely. It has affected me in good ways i'm sure in bad ways as well uh you know being one of the probably the only asians in colombia growing up was really tough because i was made fun of um i was bullied and i kind of just had to pummel through it i learned spanish very quickly because you do when you are eight or nine years old i oh, no, i was there six to eight or so but you, you learn the language very quickly. And I ended up having to prove myself. I, you know, I could speak just like anyone else. And I could, I did really well in school. And uh, when I finally started to fit in, we moved again. And I went to school in Midtown Manhattan and nobody in my class spoke Chinese to um, uh, when I was looking for an interpreter, but uh, there were two kids who were twins. And um, I think uh, they, no, I know they're Puerto Rican and they were able to help me interpret, you know, during English classes, history classes or math problems uh, with Spanish. And that was really interesting. Um, but I still struggled with school because I skipped two grades because of the age differences. And when you begin school in Colombia versus here in the States and I was always a little bit behind. I had extra curriculum classes after school, ESL. So that was really tough. I think I had barely any childhood. I barely got to play. I just was always trying to catch up. And, and it's given me a lot of anxiety that, you know, 
I mean, growing up in America gives you a lot of anxiety, period. It doesn't matter what you do. <laughs> just Everyone has anxiety here. And um, yeah, uh, but it's made me stronger and it's made me more understanding of and, and more empathetic to those who are struggling with whatever their own uh, own personal lives can bring them. Wow. Beautiful. Beautifully said. I love that the A in Amer uh, USA stands for anxiety right now in my head. Um, <laughs> But I, I mean, of all those places, I mean, that's such a, those are all significant things to go through, especially, uh, you know, you're at a young age, but which place feels the most like home? Do they all feel like home in a way? Like, how do you, like, do you want to go back to Shanghai or like Columbia? Like what, what are those relationships look like now in your adult life? That's such a good question. I feel because I've spent most of my life here now in New York, this feels most comfortable. And I haven't been back to Shanghai in a long time, but when I last was there in 2011 uh, to visit my grandparents when they were still alive, that really felt homey. And in Babylon, the scene where uh, Lady Faye is uh, in her home, in her bungalow with her mother, and we actually speak Shanghainese to each other, that was the closest thing to what my grandparents' home and my home growing up uh, looked like. And yeah, it was very, you know, shacky. And it, it's, it was, that scene was inspired by the scene, the um, set design in, in the mood for love. And um, side note that when Damien cast me and he sent me the mood board and those were the screen stills that he had emailed me. I just fell out of my chair because I was so excited that he and I loved the same film and we were inspired by the same film for Lady Faye. So yeah, so anything that um, brings me back to my grandparents' home will forever feel like home. How did it feel then in the movie being able to recreate your grandparents home and get this like beautiful memory while also you like in in your you your credits are incredible and then your rise to fame and being able to like there's so many parallels between Lily and Lady Faye like how did you navigate those like law what you mentioned earlier was you just have to hold your head up and to this day I still have to jump through many more hoops than if I looked differently, uh, I think with the amount of credits I have under my belt, somebody else would definitely uh, have a lot more projects waiting for them than I do. It's it's never going to change. It's it's much better now. I would like it to be more more normalized that we can not talk about representation in such a way that if I feel like it uh, almost gets in the way of us progressing. When I first started doing junkets and stuff, I all like top of my priority list of asking was like representing the Asian community. Like it means a lot to me. And then I started to realize that it's like, there's only one or two real answers to that kind of question. What we should be asking is about the craft, about the art, about the person behind it, right? Because that's what's going to progress us and people view us as professionals in, in the future. So that's a, Really interesting that you say that. Um, but I am curious, if you don't mind, um, what has your, how has your life changed after Babylon? Because this is like this huge, you know, award winning movie. It got a, a universal acclaim and it was, you know, people were talking about it. Obviously, an amazing cast. Um, has it gotten easier at all for you to, to book, to be to be seen for, for roles, all that? To be seen, yes. I think uh, because I have had so much TV credit under my belt, it was a little bit harder to be considered for films before Babylon, and now I'm being considered for films more often. Uh, it, but interestingly, a couple of weeks ago when I was at the premiere of um, American Born Chinese here in New York City, I saw an old friend of mine who... I was a, a co-star in one of the first shows I did, and we just we just gave each other a hug, and nothing like you know seeing someone that you really first started out with. 
And he said to me, he said, look at you, you're always working. And I said to him, but am I though? Because people only see when we're working, when we're working. You don't know what's going on in between. I waited 18 months for Babylon to go into production, as many as, as we all did because of the pandemic. But there were a lot of risks in waiting for this project that we didn't know yet if it was going to be greenlit. And there was always the possibility that it wouldn't even go into production because of all the delays. And then after Babylon, you book a show that holds on to you after you wrap and you can't do anything else. And there's a lot of waiting around. And there's also a lot of projects that come across your way and you want it, but they don't want you or they want you, but it doesn't match your idea or your journey. And it's, it's very, very, it's not as glamorous as Instagram shows it to be. Am I going to, you know, post a picture of me starfishing on my sofa, maybe one day, but most of the time it's going to be something that's glamorous and on the carpet or, you know, traveling, but people forget that. And I think that's what really is the root of so much unhappiness and anxiety because we don't see the other side. My gosh, that's so beautifully yes. said. Do you want to end the podcast now? Like, <laughs> about anything else. Oh my God. <laughs> Wow. I do have a question for you, though. With everything that you're saying, all I can think about is knowing that your mom went to the premiere for Babylon with you. What what was that like? She didn't want to come. <laughs> <laughs> My mom is, I'm, I'm, you know, I grew up very, very shy and I still am, you know, I, I definitely avoid a lot of events or I'm just awkward. <laughs> I'm so awkward at events. I just get weird and I, and then I do an Irish exit. Um, but my mom is even <laughs> more shy. And so I said, you have to come to this premiere. You, I mean, there's no, she's like, I, I don't want to see people. I don't know. It's not for me. And I said, you're coming. <laughs> I basically forced her. Um, I forced her to come and I forced her to go through makeup and hair. <laughs> and, and, and I asked my stylist to style her the whole nine. And she was like, what was the point of that? <laughs> that makes me so, oh my gosh. <laughs> She's like, what a waste of money. <laughs> Aww. I remember, um, uh, cause Drea and Bia were with your mom during the premiere, right? <laughs> Walking around, I was uh, text, cause Drea was like, hey, I just saw you on the stairs or something. And I remember like taking pictures of you on the red carpet and texting yes, Drea like, yes. tell her mom she's doing great. <laughs> She That's was awesome. like, my feet hurt. Can I go home? <laughs> okay. She's a true one. That's real. Yeah. I love yeah. it. Drea That's actually, cool. um, Drea and Bia took her home first because mm. I was still out for the night. Yeah. She Irish Best exited you. <laughs> That's great. I actually just saw Dre and Bia last night. We did an acting workshop together. Like they were really? like workshopping their scripts. Yeah. And I, I got to just I like play as one of the kids they're they're great they're they're all so talented we're gonna have oh. them on the podcast soon <laughs> we oh, got it right <laughs> i love them i absolutely they're the best 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 friends i could have really Aww. ever asked for oh. yeah, i mean they're amazing yeah and they're cool they're like really cool like they just have, have like a hip vibe to them you know oh. i always feel intimidated by like how dweeby i am in comparison um, <laughs> oh but can, can I ask you this about like the whole premiere and like the events and stuff? My mom, when I tell her about like, hey, mom, I just interviewed, you know, an Avenger or like I interviewed like uh, this big director. She does not care. There's like a handful of celebrities that she's like, oh, this is a, that's a cool celebrity or that's a cool. celebrity. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I imagine Brad Pitt passes any of those kind of tests. But did your mom care to be around the celebrities or was she just? over it from the beginning and even when she was there because now i'm curious <laughs> she i mean with with brad it's always really tricky even on set i mean the minute the ad yells cut he disappears because if, if mm. there's a lot of um extras background actors um at the party i didn't even get to see him because it was mayhem it was so crazy yeah. um i think she would have liked to meet him but I couldn't even find him that night. Um, 
But it was really exciting when I was in London and we had a cast dinner after one of the Q and A's, and I was just being silly with my phone and I was recording Jovan and I said, "Say hi to my mom." And then I just panned over to Brad's face and he said, "Hi, mom." And I was like, "All right, we're good. Okay." <laughs> That's awesome. I'm a good daughter. I did good today. <laughs> Pack it up. It's time to go. I love that. <laughs> you find out later she left the party early because she's like, if I'm not going to see Brad Pitt, I don't want to be here. Speaking of Jovan, like you and his story <laughs> were so okay as a bunch of film nerds too, like the film quality of it all. But your stories are so integral to like the American experience and filmmaking. I just I was so grateful to hear those stories and to see them. And I again, like I can't wait for that four hour cut, man. I can't wait for it. But during all of the the press interviews and everything that you did and the days and days of four minute whatever's was there uh, something that yeah. wasn't asked that you specifically you were like I want to talk about this this is what I want to talk about today I'm just waiting for the person to bring it up I, I think I wish they would have asked a little bit more about our own relationships on set are you know those are always really fun to talk about and and they always lead to more interesting stories you know, Aww. such as when Jovan and I would sing Usher in between takes. and then Which Usher would, song? You make me want to leave the one I'm with. Start a new Just relationship. new relationship with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. Wait, okay, let's get deeper into this. Like, what would you guys do offset? Like, tell me who you hung out with. What'd you go yeah, eat? Yeah, what were your, you? what was the, like, not filming day or, like, day off look like when you're on set <laughs> like that? It was tough. When we were filming, it was really tough because we, uh, we never had the same days off. I mean, we were these. Yeah, they were always such um, huge, huge scenes. Um, and most of the time we were always there together. And most of the time we were pretty exhausted because, uh, you know, Damien Chazelle is the king of wonders. And so, we're you know, those party scenes that would take two weeks, the pool scenes, the those if you're an extra and you messed up and you did not look in the right direction or you acted badly, Damien will make you do it again. You know, our average number of takes, I believe, on the steady cam was 27. Or <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> That's insane. So, yeah. I mean, those were very long takes. So it's, yeah. it's essentially I mean, like. Yeah, I love I love Wonders. It's so incredible. When I first saw it at the premiere, I was just like this. <laughs> I yeah. was like, oh my god! I have. Oh figured, wait, the first time you saw face. the film was at the premiere. No, I saw it at a screening, and I oh, okay. both times I was just like this because the oh, first time gosh. you're so much in your head, and yeah. I was just you know trying to take it all in, and I really didn't couldn't really. Um, absorb it but um, seeing it at the premiere I wanted to sit in the premiere because it was a full house and I wanted to get the energy from people I wanted to feel the energy from everyone who was attending um, but I love Wonners and those are really difficult it's essentially like rehearsing for musical theater and seeing the final product go up yeah now I have an image of Damien in a black t-shirt very you know, J.K. Simmons and Whiplash <laughs> to all the extras. You know, like you're looking at the wrong place. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> he's, he's so sweet. He's always like, like if you're not doing. I, I know Ashley probably heard this, but if you, he's such a bad liar. If he doesn't like something, <laughs> he'll come up to you, and he's so nice. He's like, um. That was good. Um, and he's trolling his hair, and you're like, ah, oh, that was terrible. We have to do it again. Oh wow! You know, and he has a tell. Yeah, and the telling twirl. Yeah, and he's like, no, that was good. We can uh, try it like that. You know, <laughs> I'll never forget when we were having camera tests, and I um one of my wigs that they tried on me was you know like an Asian, very stereotype Asian bob mm -hmm. cut with the bangs across. And I remember I walked up to him and he said, okay, how long will it take for us to get out of that wig? <laughs> it was just so funny. That's awesome. I'm watching Why Women Kill right now and I can't wait for you to come on screen. <laughs> oh my God, that was one of my favorite things to work on. Lucy Liu is amazing. <laughs>
Yeah, I, I agreed to work as a local and um, I was like hemorrhaging money, hemorrhaging out of my own bank account just to work with her. Um, yeah, she's amazing. Okay, Lily, so you have done so much press and so many interviews between your time on like Quantico and everything that you've done. I want to know, what do you want to tell the audience? So this is our time to pass you the literal microphone and you get the platform to say whatever you want to the audience and however way you want to say it, whether it be advice you want to give or a tidbit of knowledge or just a fact that you want to tell them, this is your platform. I think that we're obsessed with putting too much work into social media platforms. Um, I, I think it's just becoming out, it's, it's gone out of control to the point where there is no real creativity anywhere else except on TikTok and Instagram. And I just sometimes need to take a break from my, my Instagram because it's, I think, you know, it's such a great platform for people to, you know, display their creativity but sometimes it's just I, I we all need to take a beat and just just do yeah, I don't know go back go back like five years and and find a balance between what's healthy and and what's real art <laughs> I don't know how to say it 100 yeah I love that I am a big we, fan of Instagram breaks I was gonna say we live yeah. in an era where we're all getting way too much information way too easily um and yeah. And it's like in uh, it's like kind of like, look what I'm doing kind of mentality. So I think that is a yeah. great note. Um, but that's not to say you shouldn't follow us on Instagram and Twitter. <laughs> Tremendous talk. Podcast. Just- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's tough for the, the younger generation, but, you know, people should be more aware of who they follow and who they believe, because it can be so dangerous. It's a slippery slope and it can really like I said, the root of all anxiety and depression. And people really need to be smart about who they follow. It's it's such a pleasure to be able to talk with you because even watching your interviews too and being able to like have the pleasure of of watching (laughs) it from start to finish and being there for the whole like Babylon ride of it all. It was such a pleasure to like watch you and hear your mind, but also I just sitting there and being like, and ask this question yeah. about her like yeah, ask yeah. more in-depth details and so now being able to do that it was it's really cool and just being able to like tell the world more of who you are and what you love and what you do it's it's such an honor dude like it's so great oh gosh thank you Th- I, and i i pleasure is mine because i i'm so grateful to be asked such wonderful questions <laughs> you know like thank you so much thank you so much for taking the time um this is like super 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 cool yeah. i didn't get to do the babylon junket stuff so it was just like nice to talk about the movie and like hear those cool stories because it's a it's a wild ass film so so it is. Very, I'm, I'm glad that you found your zen again though <laughs> and <Yeah>. like <laughs> are like are, are like recharging your mana at your mom's house that's great that's awesome oh, yeah. That's awesome. yeah yeah it's always good to take care of ourselves what a wonderful freaking chat dude yeah yeah she was really cool um really cool really down to earth uh and 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 i wish i could have that kind of like like almost like 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 zen energy you know what i mean i'm a really chill. big person and so when i get excited i use i sound excited you know what i mean like like oh it I sound crazy but she's just really chill and really cool and and wise there was some wisdom yeah. in there that was exciting yeah i really hear. like listening to her conversation la can you imagine being like an introvert being stuck in a room with both of us oh yeah no that would be kind of like torture probably right i think it'd be literally physical torture at that point <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> She's like, tell us what your favorite food is. Um, I don't want to. <laughs> you want to do a reel with us? <laughs> <laughs> That's really <Stop>. funny. <laughs> um, but let's talk takeaways. I mean, uh, what a journey her career has had from going from TV to this giant film, uh, now navigating the entertainment space still as like, oh, you know, an Asian woman trying to like get her, you know, get her flowers it seems like you know receive her flowers in this career that she's been doing for so long or some of your takeaways as you know a fellow asian woman doing the same grind right now 
You know what? It brought me, it both made me mad and it brought me comfort at the same time. Because there's a lot of stuff that I personally resonated with, like the competitiveness and, and the way she mm-hmm. grew up and kind of the difficulties that she faced in growing up. But then in, while she was talking, I'm like, and that has helped you so much in your career. And you can kind of see it too. Like, and even in Lady Faye in herself, like the competitive nature and the way she really had to fight and, and like struggle, and but she made it. And I think- mm-hmm both facing that adversity and figuring it out along the way helps, but also why, like, why does she have so many credits and she's not getting calls literally sure. back to back to back every single day? Like, but also it was just really cool to see who she is. I just really yeah. like talking to her. It, it was such a great conversation. And again, like during the press of it all, uh, we saw a lot about Lady Faye. We saw a lot about the movie, but I don't think I really got to know Lily as a person and just being able to talk to her for an hour and like get her thoughts on life was really a, a honor. That was really cool. What about yeah. you, Lila? I mean, plenty of takeaways uh, from from kind of the... Um, I love the reality checks that talent gives us when, when we have them on the podcast because it's like it, it, it tells the audience it's like, yeah, it's not all glamorous. It's not all sunshine and Davies. Sometimes it's bullshit and poop, you know, which are literally in the first synonymous in a of way. Babylon. <laughs> yeah, actually, you're right. And death and, and, and uh, overdose. But uh, well, that's besides the point. Um, but I, I, I just like really appreciate her being open and, and telling us that stuff. And, 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 you know, even like all the onset knowledge, that's the best, you know, like learning to drive stick shift or like the relationship she, she had with Jovan or, or like the fact that Brad Pitt gets ushered out of, you know, the scene because there's just so many extras and it's just like a liability at that point. Right. Like all that stuff is like really wild to hear. Um, but I think what's what you said also resonates with me is just like there's like some hopeful stuff in there, you know, like, like, yeah, it's not always going to be an easy road, but you're still on the road, right? Like you're still making your way downtown, walking fast, moving, you know, face to pass in your homebound. You know da, what da, I mean? Da, 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 da. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. It makes me so happy to be able to have this. We're such in a lucky position to be able to have this rapport with people who we really love and we see on these films and to have a one on one human conversation with them, because I feel like a lot of these times the people that we get to speak to in entertainment are so like dehumanized Mm -hmm. and are just like these essences that are in entertainment and they're not like real people and i love that we get to break down like who was this real human being person like what are they like. Yeah. You know, like you have a team behind you making you look the way you look and telling you certain things to say. So I I am always going to be grateful for having a platform where we can kind of just like say what we want to say and ask what we want to ask. Um, So that's what I'm grateful for right now is that we have this platform and that we have great people like Lily to join us. Um, But yeah, it was a good day. It was a good day. I think I'm grateful for honesty. That was a theme Mm -hmm. in this for me between like honesty amongst your peers, honesty Mm -hmm. amongst the industry, honesty within yourself. And Mm -hmm. yeah, I I like that a lot. Just how how, saying it, how it is, how it is. I don't know the phrase that I'm thinking of, but you know what it is what it is. It's probably (laughs) maybe or or um, I have nothing. I have I have nothing. But I, I also appreciate the honesty. (laughs) <laughs> but that's going to do it for today's episode of Tremendous Talk Podcast. And make sure to stay tuned because we're going to have so many more wonderful guests. So uh, and, many. and don't forget, Ash, you're tremendous. Ah, Long, you know what? You're tremendous, too. <laughs> and you know what, people out there? You are all tremendous. We and are this tremendous. This is a Tremendous Talk Podcast. Pew, pew, pew. The Tremendous Talk Podcast is produced by Lawrence Sharma, Ashley Rapuano Sanchez, Gabriela David, Joseph Feralde, and Jeremiah Abraham in collaboration with Tremendous. The Tremendous Talk Podcast jingle is by Jared Sanchez and Ashley Rapuano Sanchez, produced at Hamsterdam Records.